Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you to the very first of our county's redistricting meetings. My name is Dennis Bozanich. I'm the assistant to the county executive officer for the county of Santa Barbara, and I'll be the host for this evening uh, here in Carpinteria. Uh, so we know we have a few folks in the audience today, as well as many people watching uh, at television at home. Uh, first, uh, tonight, I wanted to recognize and thank a few folks uh, before we get started. Uh, well, first of all, I want to thank the uh, City of Carpinteria for hosting us, uh, the staff here, Larry and Kevin and the rest of the folks that have helped us make this possible. I also want to recognize several people from the county staff as well that are here. Our county surveyor, Mike Emmons, is here, uh, as well as Tenyel, who is our GIS technician, and uh, as well as Woody, who is uh, with our county council's office. So we uh, will be having different parts of the presentation that each will be uh, overseeing as we go through this evening. So I just wanted to start real briefly. We're going to, the way today's going to work is about a 20 minute presentation uh, for uh, just an overview about what redistricting is. And then in the second part of uh, the presentation, uh, we're going to have a brief uh, GIS demonstration. And then so you can see how the GIS uh, system works. And uh, G GIS, should I, I should say, is the geographic information system. It's collects all the uh, population data and correlates that to specific geographic spaces. And that's how we're able to then use it to move boundaries around and recalculate populations. Uh, so we'll get a demonstration of that. And then uh, at the end, we'll um, open it up for public comment. And uh, with the size crowd we have today, we'll be able to be fairly generous with your public comments. So with that, uh, I'd like to go ahead and get started. So we have. Uh, a little bit of a PowerPoint presentation. So our main purpose for all of these redistricting meetings is really designed to provide the information about what redistricting is and why we do it. So that'll be the very first part of the presentation. Next is to really encourage as much broad participation as we can. Our Board of Supervisors has been really clear about wanting to um, not start with maps that they designed, but wanted to go out and listen to what the public had to say so that then that input is going to be used in drawing the district boundaries. Uh, and then the final part is to really um, get that feedback from you so we can take that back and report it back to the Board of Supervisors a little bit later on this summer. So a couple things to uh, think about. If you want to get more information, we have a website available and at the very back page of your packet, uh, there is uh, the website is listed there. And so you feel free to um, uh, go to the uh, district, uh, pardon me, the redistricting website. Uh, so that's available. Um, we also have a Twitter feed uh, that's set up with that. For those of you who uh, know anything about Twitter, it's a really short little communication tool, uh, and you can give it uh, give little short messages. And I usually do updates every day or two whenever there's new developments. And then you can also sign up for an email. Uh, 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 that we send out about once or twice a week as well, uh, about the same time where we'll send out an email that'll give you the latest information about what's happening with the redistricting process. So those are the, some of the main things. Um, in addition to that, uh, we've got these uh, whole series of public workshops we've got scheduled. As I said, this is the first. There's another one in Santa Barbara this coming Wednesday, Mar uh, May 18th at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. And uh, that will be uh, another opportunity uh, here on the South Coast to be able to participate in the redistricting process. Uh, then we also, in uh, the handout, and I'll go through that a little bit later on, we have a series of public GIS sessions. So if you have a great idea for what you think the districts ought to look like, you can uh, go and, and make an appointment for one of these public GIS sessions on a Tuesday or a Thursday over the next three or four weeks. You can go and you can sit down with Mike and Tenyel, and they will help you build your own proposal and all the demographic reports that you might need. So those public GIS sessions are available to you as well. We really encourage you, if you'd like to um, get your, give your hand at uh, trying uh, to redistrict the county on your own. And then finally, um, we do have a series of board meetings coming up. Uh, the very first one uh, will be on July 12th, where we'll be covering uh, the material and the information we gather at all these public sessions. Uh, we'll be reporting that to the board and we'll be asking uh, the board what they would like us to do next uh, in terms of creating maps and proposals. 
Uh, we will need to turn around and come back most likely on August 2nd with uh, the proposals that the public brings forward as well as any other maps that the board directs us to create uh, based on your feedback and your information. We'll get those and uh, bring those to the board on August 2nd at a public hearing and you and others will be able to come and participate in that public hearing with the Board of Supervisors um, with the hope that we will have a final vote on a redistricting plan at the August 9th Board of Supervisors meeting. So what we have to do, just so you know, is the absolute deadline is going to be, uh, will be October 31st. We have to have the redistricting plan approved and in place. So we're trying to be well ahead of that. Okay. So uh, this is a listing uh, here of all the public workshops we have coming up, as well as the GIS sessions. And if you turn in your handouts, uh, I believe it's uh, page seven and eight have the GIS, um, pardon me, uh, yeah, seven, eight, and nine have the upcoming schedule of events. Okay. So what is redistricting? Let's get into the kind of the meat of the presentation today. So redistricting is really just simply the process of redetermining the boundaries so that you get more or less equal population in each of the supervisorial districts. And in the, back in the day, we used to use a term called reapportionment, right? You remember, remember hearing that word back in the 70s and 80s? And that word has kind of lost its favor. It's really the same process of redetermining the district boundaries uh, for a, a given jurisdiction, in our case, the county of Santa Barbara. Uh, cities sometimes have to redistrict if they have uh, council boundaries. Uh, they have to redistrict. Um, and here in the state of California, something really different has happened with uh, congressional districts and the assembly and senate districts. Those have been given over to a, a re redistricting committee of citizens. Uh, people applied and, and are part of a large committee that's going across the state to determine statewide boundaries. And so it's a little bit different process now at the state level. But here at the county level, uh, it's this process of redetermining the district boundaries. And we have a map here representing the current district boundaries uh, as they re are represented today. And so this is just a, as a way of kind of giving you a sense about what it is that we're having to look at. So let's um, get down into uh, a little bit of the criteria. And with this, I'd like to... Um, ask uh, Woody to come up and, and speak a little bit about the specific legal criteria for creating districts uh, according to both California law as well as the federal regulations as well. So, Woody? Okay, as was just explained, uh, redistricting is required by the federal and the state constitution as well as election code section 21500. If you go to the back of your redistricting packet, you'll see that the relevant election code provisions uh, and what is known as the Federal Voting Rights Act, which is uh, 42 United States, United States Code 1973, uh, should be set out in your packet. Um, the first criteria, there's several criteria that you have to look at when you go through the redistricting process, and this is somewhat of a fluid process because as you change boundary, boundary lines, you have to try to apply these criteria. Uh, Section 21500 of the Election Code sets out two mandatory criteria that you have to adhere to when you go through this process. The first is that districts be drawn as nearly equal as possible, meaning that the populations within each district should be as close as possible population-wise. Uh, the purpose behind this is to protect people and their representation and you must use the census information uh, and you use a total population of the census. So you look at the census information and the entire population, you divide it by five in this case, and that will give you the ideal district size in terms of population. This really addresses the size of the districts and how you draw the lines. The second mandatory requirement is the Federal Voting Rights Act. This, of course, protects voters. Uh, and minorities and it protects their access access to the political process and tries to ensure equal representation and equal access. This section requires compliance. Um, so when boundary lines are drawn, you have to take a look at the demographic data and be aware of how those boundary lines affect the demographic data and ensure your compliance with the 
Federal Voting Rights Act, and I'll explain that a little bit later. As to equal population, that is essentially what's referred to as one person, one vote. Again, as I said, districts should be as equal as possible in terms of population. You will have some deviations, perhaps for one reason or another you may have a deviation. If there is a deviation, they must be justified by some policy or one of the other criteria. You want to try to avoid deviations. The cases have said, the more recent cases have said as equal as possible in terms of population deviations. So try to avoid them if you can. And there's really no presumptive validity to any sort of a deviation. In other words, there's no safe harbor. You can't have, say, less than 5% and you're okay in terms of population deviation. You might have something like a 5% deviation and it may be okay if it can be justified based upon some rational policy or some of the other criteria. Okay, getting back to the Federal Voting Rights Act, Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act, that's the one that you have to be aware of, essentially prohibits any voting practice or procedure that results in the denial or abridgment of anyone's right to vote based on race, color, or minority language status. It applies to redistricting and prohibits electoral systems which dilute minority voting rights by denying minorities an equal opportunity to nominate, elect candidates or elect candidates of their choice. One of the things you'll have to look at, just as an example, is what's called vote dilution. So if you have a district, for example, that is constituted of a 50% plus 1% of a minority population protected by Section 2, when you're drawing your boundaries, you have to be careful to not intentionally divide that minority population in an effort to dilute. That's a per se violation of Section 2 of the Voting Rights Act. The Voting Rights Act also has been amended, was amended a few years ago by Congress, to prohibit any sort of a drawing of a boundary which results in the dilution of a minority vote. So if you have a district that's 50% plus minority, and then you draw that line, you have to look at the result of that boundary change you made and see if you did what's commonly referred to as split the vote or reduce that minority to below 50%. You cannot use race under Section 2 cases as a predominant factor in drawing your boundaries, nor does Section 2, however, require the drawing of a boundary to maximize a minority district. The main case in this case, the main U.S. Supreme Court case in this area is Thornburg v. Gingles, and what's commonly referred to as Gingles, and I'll give you an example of how it's applied. First, you must have a sufficiently large and compact minority, that is 50% plus one of the population of the district must be comprised of a minority population. That minority population must be politically cohesive, they tend to vote together, and the majority vote sufficiently votes together as a block to defeat the minority's preferred candidate. If you have those preconditions, then the Supreme Court says the courts will look at the totality of the circumstances to determine whether there's been a violation of Section 2. Okay, moving on, we go to Election Code Section 21500, which, of course, contains equal protection, I mean, equal population is a mandatory requirement as well as the Voting Rights Act compliance, but it also contains several permissive considerations for how you draw the boundaries. These criteria are contiguity. Essentially, this means what you think it means, that you want to have, you don't want to create islands somewhere of a district. So one of the tests is whether you can go from one point within the district to another point on that boundary of that district without ever leaving the district. So that one should be fairly simple to address. Compactness. Compactness has been defined by the courts as ability of citizens to relate to each other combined with their geographic proximity to each other. So what you need to take into account is a sense of community made possible by open lines of access and communication, consider availability and facility of transportation and communication between people in a proposed district, 
and between people and the candidates in a district and between people and their elected representatives and again there's a component here that's geographic in nature where you want something that's compact in the sense that it's not spread out from one end of the county to the other you want center to that district and something that's relatively close in proximity the other criteria are geography and topography so you have to consider natural barriers such as mountains rivers and just give due consideration to those factors when you draw boundaries you try to maintain geographic integrity as far as is practical you may not be able to do it but you try to do it you also try to maintain political boundaries to the extent permissible so that's what's meant by geography and topography there's a lot of cases out there to talk about in various different terms and use different examples but essentially that's about as broad a definition as I could find communities of interest this is the last permissive criteria and it talks about the social and economic economic interests common to the population of an area which are probable subjects of legislative action generally termed community of interests these should be considered in determining whether the area should be should remain whole this is a broad definition so you just have to look at what what that area is that you're you're looking at is it is it is it socially and economically cohesive to people share the same transportation do they have the same type of work all these factors come together when you're trying to figure out if a particular area is a community of interest these are all the criteria that that apply and in the way you have to apply these is as you change the boundaries you're going to see numbers change and you're going to see population numbers change and demographics change so just be mindful of these criteria and apply them and see what you end up with and hopefully you're in compliance thanks Woody very much I appreciate that explanation are there any questions for Woody while we had him here you know on the legal side maybe we can just take questions at this point for for Woody too and while we're on the legal things this seems to be a particular area of concern so why don't we go ahead and maybe I can repeat the question and we'll but what is integrity what does it mean by in the context of the criteria integrity usually refers to geographic geographic integrity so you want to maintain districts within the naturally occurring geographic boundaries other question other questions for counsel good okay very good you did such a great presentation you had no questions that's great all right let's go on all right so now what we'd like to do is just spend a little time looking at the population numbers as as they've changed and this very first graph really begins to tell a picture about why we're having to redistrict this year and in this graph if you look at the bars at the on the left hand side there you see district 1 through 5 going from left to right and one of the things you'll notice is that the population uh, relative to 2000 here in District 1 if you're a District 1 resident the population has actually declined and it's uh, now much lower not a much lower but lower than it was before and in fact um, it's about a 4% decline in population in District 1 and there's probably a lot of uh, demographic reasons why that's the case uh, and so for those of you who are residents here you're probably aware of that but one of the factors that we've seen is the number of homes that in 2000 census had multiple people in the homes are now one or two person residents so uh, kind of like my my kids have grown up gone away to school and uh, nobody else has moved in and so the population has begun to perhaps shrink here uh, districts two three and four their population uh, totals are relatively flat two three four percent growth is all we saw in any of those districts uh, between 2000 and 2010 census data um, the thing that really is uh, probably is most striking is District 5. Uh, and in District 5, we saw nearly 30% growth in population uh, between the 2000 and 2010 census. Uh, when you look at the numbers that you see here uh, and the uh, target population for any of these districts is now at 80, 
five, eight, I'm, I'm at, looking at Mike now, 84,779 people. 84,779. So that would be the target population. Right now in, in District 1, we have over 101,000 residents in District 1. So you can see we're quite a bit out of alignment. We're about 16,000 over uh, what we would need to be in, dist in District 5. Here in District 1, we're about 8,000 under where we would want to be. So you can see there's a uh, kind of a ripple effect or a domino effect that needs to happen with population moving fr out of five into four, into three, into two, and eventually into one. Okay, so that's the, the general trend. And if you were to look at the map here, what that just generally means is District 5 is going to shrink geographically in order to allow the people that are here in five to move into four or three and then eventually into two and into one. So that's the basic flow of how the population. If we want to look at it the other way, if we want to have be South Coast centric, we could say District 1 needs to grow <laughs> and we need to take more people from two and three in particular, but then they need to continue to um, add more population and eventually take out of District 5. Yes, we have a question. It's okay. Yeah. So what you, yes, yeah, so the question is, is when you say increase or decrease, what are we really talking about? So there's kind of two ways to think about this, that often what has to happen in order to increase the population, increase the numbers, okay, as we need to increase in District 1, you actually have to, um, you actually have to grow the size of the district physically, right? So that becomes really critical. And the same thing, if we want to, um, if the district is too large, too many people, we have to decrease the size by moving the people into the subsequent district. So it isn't quite as simple as, as kind of it being a direct domino effect because m multiple districts often touch one another and you could make uh, decisions and suggestions that would allow population to move from multiple districts. So it's not a linear process. It's more of an interactive process. So hopefully that answered the question about, about what happens. Okay. One of the things you'll, uh, you'll notice on this particular map that we have for display purposes here in the room today is um, we have each of the districts outlined in different colors, and then you're going to see some gray shading within each of those. The gray shading represents where there's actually people in a given census block. Now, let me uh, do a little vocabulary here. Uh, census tracts are kind of the largest unit, and here, actually, the black lines you would see here, this would be equal to a census tract. It's a fairly large, large uh, section, usually uh, eight, 9,000 people, typically in a census tract. Census tract has subunits called census blocks. And a census block uh, obviously is a smaller section, and those blocks usually have anywhere from 800, around 800 or so folks per census block, give or take. In urban areas, it can vary quite dramatically. In fact, in my little block in downtown Santa Barbara, literally one square block is a census block, okay? Whereas out here in an area of rural uh, Santa Barbara County, uh, this whole gray area here would be a census block, which could be literally uh, several square miles, okay, as we look at that map. So we've got to want to be thinking about that. When we move population from one district to another, we move population at the census block level. So as Woody was mentioning a moment ago, we try to get population as nearly equal as possible. The one thing we can't do is split census blocks because we don't actually know within a given geographical census block where the people actually live, so we can't break it down any smaller than that. So as we go, you're going to see still some variation in populations as even at the end of this redistricting process. Even if we were perfect, we could never get all of the blocks to exactly equal the same population in every single district, and we'd make ourselves gray and bald trying to do it, okay? So we just want to be kind of aware of that, all right?
So a couple, a little bit more about the population changes. I've got another graph here that just shows the population changes by uh, city, by incorporated city. We have eight incorporated cities in the county. Uh, here in Carpinteria, for example, the population has declined about 7.5% here in the city of Carpinteria. Uh, and so you, you see those as well. When you look at some place like Santa Maria, the population growth in the city of Santa Maria has been nearly 30%. Uh, when you look within city boundaries. Everything else has been fairly flat, fairly flat. Yes, ma'am. The yellow lines represent, very good question, thank you. It's a complicated graph. Um, represent on the access going, access going on the uh, left, on the right-hand side over here, you'll see percentage numbers, and those show the percentage growth or percentage decline of those bars between the 2000 and 2010 census. So. So you can see, Buellton percentage-wise has grown quite a lot, right? Almost 30, 25, 30 percent. But in terms of total numbers, it's still a relatively small city. Yes, sir. Given that, right. Interesting. I don't know when the controversy happened about this is uh, the, just a rephrase for the folks watching on TV. The gentleman was raising the point of the Sam Piper mobile home park and whether or not it was actually uh, counted and those numbers were factored in. Uh, what, we, what I can tell you is we have the official census data and if we knew a geographic location, we could actually go into our mapping software that we have in front of you. It might be fun for our demo purposes later on um, to drill down. Is that over on Via Real and... Um, Thirty-nine, 3,900 block of Real, maybe? Or 3,900 or 4,000 block of Villarreal. Um, I'm trying to think. It's right over there by the uh, Chevron station and... Um, oh, I'm sorry, west side of that. Okay. Yeah, I'm, I can picture it. I ride by it, but I... Kramer. Kramer, yeah. So we could perhaps... Yeah, we could try to find it and bring it up, and we can um, we can look at the actual population density in a block at that level, and so we can check that out for you. You can tell us that those numbers sound right to you based on the number of folks. You see, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, so I, I think you know there may have been some decline, and and there are there are always those. And one of the things about census data, it's an ongoing process, and we know it's you know not exactly uh, the hard count we'd like it to be every single year. There is a variation uh, that we all recognize within that census data itself, and so uh, I think they make every every uh, one of their best efforts in order to uh, make it as as accurate as possible. But there are times when it may not quite be as accurate as it as we would know it to be. So that, I think that's a, a fair thing. Um, just a little bit uh, to just to kind of wrap up some of the demographics, um, to look at some of the uh, demographic changes in terms of ethnicity. Uh, this is a comparison between 2000 and 2010. Uh, and when you think about, if we looked at the total county, um, the face of the county, if you will, uh, and we looked at the various ethnic and minority groups that are here represented, um, this uh, chart shows what that would look like um, between 2000 and 2010. And a couple of the things that, I mean, stand out there would be the growth in the Hispanic uh, population. And just a, a little word about the Hispanic uh, count this time in the census data. It was handled um, quite a bit differently, and in fact, the ethnic categories changed pretty dramatically between 2000 and 2010. So we've had to extrapolate the data 
from 2000 to 2010 to get it to solve for that. There are a number of new categories. For example, you could select in 2010 that you did not have the option for in 2000. So that may change and cause some variation in the number. But overall, there is a growth in the Hispanic population uh, countywide, as you can see in this chart. So um, there are a number of other um, statistics here just to look at. So if we looked at District 1, um, probably the district you all are most familiar with here, you can see that in 2000 we had just under 80,000 uh, in the district, and, and you can see now that the census total with or without the uh, mobile, home tra uh, mobile home park will be uh, something uh, a little bit uh, under 76,000 folks. Um, and the variance number you see over there is not the variance between 2000 and 2010, obviously, for um, those of you. Uh, it is, the variance is what the 2010 census would need to add in order to get to the average county population or a average district population for the county in 2010. So down here at the very bottom, you see this number, I've mentioned it a little bit earlier, this 84,779. That's the target population that each of our districts, as we go through this redistricting process, that will be our goal. But what we want to get as close to as possible. So for District 1, the current District 1 boundaries, we would need to add 8,800, almost 8,900 people in order to be able to achieve that target population. And as Woody mentioned in his presentation, our goal here is to have as close to one person, one vote as possible between all the districts. Uh, going, going on uh, north or west and then north, uh, District 2, uh, you can see there's about a 3,000 3, uh, person difference between our 2010 actual and what is our target population that's needed. Uh, 3 is about uh, 2,800 obviously, and then about 2,000 people are needed in four. But the real, um, real thing to be thinking about is there's 16,000 more people in District 5 um, that need to then be reallocated by moving the boundaries throughout the rest of the districts. That's the chore ahead of us. Okay. So the goal here. So as Woody mentioned, the criteria we have is that we have to have nearly equal population in each of those districts. Nearly equal. All right. And as I mentioned before, we can't be perfect about it uh, because blocks are not divisible. So we got to leave blocks whole. And when sometimes there's several hundred people in a block, we can't divide that if it's uh, something that we need to do. We leave it there. We, that target population is is that 84,779 folks that we need to put into each of the districts. The other goal we really have is that this be an open process. We're not walking in here, uh, I'm part of the county staff, part of the county executive staff, uh, none of us from county council, nobody from the county surveyors, from public works, anywhere else. None of us have a preconceived notion about what the districts are going to look like. All right, We're walking in really trying to gain uh, some wisdom and insight from you. That's the main purpose of this. And in fact, the board was really specific. We don't want to ask the people to react to something we, that we put together. We want to hear from them first, and then we'll design it from there. So yes, ma'am, we've got a question. Can I suggest that it's easier yeah. to Yes, ma'am. That you reverse the strategic conclusion. Oh. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Yeah, so that, yeah, the, the variance is we really need to lose. Yeah, the goal is we need to lose six, or have 16,000 less or add 8,000 more. Yeah, fine. That's a great suggestion. Next time, Santa Barbara, it'll be changed. Yeah, thank you. Um, and then finally, um, that we want to make sure that it's as broad a public participation as possible. So, uh, for example, we're doing seven of these meetings. Uh, we're doing them um, bilingually, English and Spanish. As you can tell if you're in the room, we're um, translating it simultaneously into Spanish so everybody can participate in the process. So we wanted to make sure that we had as broad a participation as possible in this process. All right. Any other questions about that? There's additional statistics in your packet here that I'd you know, refer you to as well, um, some more breakdowns. One of the things you will see in there is a listing not just of the cities, but of what they call census-designated spots. Places, places, yeah. Uh, census designated places. Uh, so you may see some um, other places that uh, are, are have population counts associated with them. So those are in this uh, material as well. 
But what I'd like to do is turn it over to Mike and Tanyelle to do a, a GIS demonstration uh, for you, uh, just to show you what's possible with the, the software and uh, how um, the day 20 years ago when a lot of us used to do redistricting um, at home just for fun uh, and for sport, uh, we used to have to do it with big maps and hand calculators. Uh, and uh, it's pretty cool what uh, technology can do today. So Mike Emmons. Thank you very much, Dennis. Yeah, I understand you were doing redistricting about, what, 20 years ago or so with uh, in the middle of the night uh, with sheets. So um, uh, good evening, everyone. Um, what we'd like to show you tonight is uh, some software that um, the County Board of Supervisors authorized us to purchase. And um, it really is going to look quite simple, I think, when you see it. Uh, it uh, was prepared by a company back in Virginia by the name of ArcBridge. And it, uh, the CEO of the company is a PhD who used to work for the U.S. Census during the 2000 Census. Uh, we've taken all of the information. Uh, they they uh, put together a package for us. It runs uh, on top of another piece of software called uh, ArcGIS. And uh, it's a very powerful tool in the redistricting process. Um, the, uh, the software uh, came to us and um, we checked with the, against the, uh, excuse me, the uh, California uh, Department of Finance uh, figures and everything that we've seen uh, matches that exactly. So we're quite comfortable that we have the correct information. Can you bring it up on the screen, Tim Yelfer? Now, the, the good th part about this software is, is, is uh, it can calculate the demographics and the population changes on the fly. So it, it, it really is quite powerful. Rather than sitting down with a calculator and trying to have to add everything, this thing does it automatically. If you look up on the screen, you can see, as Dennis pointed out before, that there's the, the heavy, dark black lines. Those are census tracts themselves. And there's about 90 of those tracts uh, here in the county of Santa Barbara. Inside of those tracks, they, there are census blocks, and Dennis uh, told you about uh, the census block itself. They, we can't split census blocks, but there's uh, about 10,300 or so, give or take a few, of those inside of the census tracks. If you want to window in, uh, Tanyel, maybe into the first part of uh, Santa Barbara here. Maybe go a little closer. Now it's kind of hard to see, I think, on the screen, but you can you can see the um, gray lines that are underneath, particularly in the green area. That would, is the first district, and you can see the green lines underneath. And each one of those are census blocks. You can see they vary in shape and size. There's also various uh, amounts of population that are inside of those census blocks. We've seen populations anywhere from two, three, four, eight hundred people, all the way down to one or two. For example, on the islands, there's uh, census blocks that have four people and seven people for a total of 11 on the islands. Now, in the upper right-hand corner, you can see um, a, a report. And this is, we can have any kind of demographic information that we want to report on. But what you're seeing here right now is uh, each one of the individual districts and the current population as it exists in our plan today. and and the difference of population in order to get to the target, which Dennis uh, told you was 84,779. The first district has uh, 75,906, I think. And uh, the difference right now is the minus 873, so we have to gain 8,873 people. What I'm going to have Tanyel do is I'm going to have him select this entire tract area that's in the northwest side. It's just north of uh, State Street. And he's going to select that entire area, and he's going to move it from District 2 into District 1, and we'll see the population change. Now, what he basically has to do is just put a little window around the area. And it's a, essentially a drag and drop process. It's that simple. How many hours did you spend, Dennis? I think uh, hundreds of hours. Coffee. 
Now, right now, the selection that he's had, uh, he's selected 862 people, I think it says there. And all he's going to do is drag that. And you can see the demographics that go with it. Any of the census information that's reported on by the U.S. Census is included in that selection. Then he can take that and he can drag it from the second district and put it into the first district. It'll turn it green. So now it's in the first district. And the new report showing us what the population difference is now says that we need 8,011 people left to add to the first district. We have a question. Yes, it, it recalculates every district with all the demographic information at the same time. There's 38 different categories of demographic information, and you can slide it back and forth, and you can see any of that, but it, it does change those automatically. Now, this is the kind of thing that you would see in the, the GIS sessions that we have, that um, you can easily get a, an appointment with us. We typically do it in one-hour blocks. Um, sometimes it'll take longer. It could take a couple hours, you can, but you can sign up with us. All you need to do is uh, call our telephone number, Public Works, 568-3000 make an appointment for either Tuesday or Thursday of this week, next week, and I think we have one extra one in June, I think it is. So what Tanyel is doing is just adding different blocks to it, and that's the process that you're going to see, uh, just strictly for population. Okay, anybody have any questions? Yes. Um, we looked at those options, and uh, it was exceptionally expensive to put this kind of an application online. We do have an interactive map that was uh, prepared by our staff, and you can look at it, and you can actually see the population in each one of the census blocks, and you can kind of do it um, by hand that way. But to put it out online, this it, it was exceptionally expensive. Okay. All right, thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, yes, yeah, so you can go to the redistricting website, and on there is this interactive map that Michael was just uh, describing, and, and it does allow you to zoom in, uh, kind of if you can picture like Google Maps, you can zoom in as uh, down to the block level, and up will pop up the uh, population data uh, there, and then you have to get out your handy-dandy uh, calculator and start uh, adding up the numbers for you. So that becomes kind of the next next step of the process for you. But it does give you the ability. It's the same exact data that they're running here. Uh, it's the same data. So you could go and come up with a probably 90% or 95% of a plan scouted out um, by doing that kind of work on your own and then by coming back and sitting down with Mike and with Tenniel and actually being able to develop your own map right from there. Yes? Yeah. Oh, Sandpiper. So we were going to take a look at that for the, so let's see. Uh, so if we do Via Real, which runs parallel to 101 there on the mountain side of 101. Yeah. So the one thing that I've learned um, from these two folks um, in, with the GIS is um, it's an incredibly powerful tool. There's so much data in there. Um, and it's just a matter of calling up the different layers of data, um, turning them, switching them on and off to be able to get something that's um, visible and seeable. And then Kramer is uh, C-R-A-M-E-R. -E and it should be between, Lin what is it, Linden and... Um, Craven, that's right. Okay, now I think you're out right in about the right neighborhood there. See, that's Kramer, I think, is that uh, track boundary, right? Is that Kramer where the track boundary is? Oh, that's Kramer Circle. The other Kramer is the other one. It is that track boundary there. Craven Lane, okay. Craven. Craven, okay. Craven. All right. And then the, is this? That looks like Sandpiper here to the left. Okay, to the left. So this area here? Right. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, so we can click on that and we can get the population numbers for you. So you've hand counted everybody, right? So we know what to compare it against. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> yeah, on your way in. <laughs> in your spare time. <laughs> yes. There's no population there. Yeah. Uh, the census. Somebody missed something. I won't blame who. Yeah. Actually, the boy. I don't know of a, of a process to fix that. Yeah, about missed data, yeah. You know, we're going to have to do some research and to take into consideration what might be the options there. I think we'll let um, some folks do some deep thinking about that and, and do that. What, what would you just guess, just for the heck of it? Okay. I mean, we can go back and get the probably the units, um, the unit number of units in there, and do a little simple math, and probably come up with something that would be reasonable about what it might be. But yeah, okay, all right. Oh, okay. Well, that's interesting. So those are some other smaller census blocks that are associated with the adjoining. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we can do so. Well, we can definitely do some research. No, I no, I appreciate the the feedback. I think that's exactly the kind of stuff we want to hear. Uh, you know, interestingly enough, um, I know in 2000 I was going through the records, and in 2000 um, they found um, most of the University of California Santa Barbara on campus students actually living on the airport, and and. Um, and uh, then there was nobody living on campus, uh, so you just uh, so things like that happen, and and we can maybe make some adjustments for that. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, there's no way to change the data. This is all imported and downloaded from the feds, and so it kind of it is what it is um, at this point. Now, what we choose to do with that from a policy perspective is is a different matter. So we can we can make some allowances at that point. So. Yes, sir. Yeah. So remember this: census is not necessarily correlated with any other kinds of uh, services, any other kinds of rights. It really is an attempt um, by the government to account for every single person. But it doesn't diminish anybody's access to services, does not diminish their ability to vote or anything else. It's merely um, a, a enumeration of all of the folks in the country. Now, interestingly, it is used for allocating resources at times. And so in very significant undercount situations, um, it has been um, uh, uh, people have sued to make sure that they are fully represented because there may be a chance that uh, those resources are allocated based on population in a di given district or within a given state and those that could have a serious impact in terms of the resources available. So yeah, it's a good question. I mean, but undercounting, undercounting and overcounting is a real concern. The census, they really do try to do well, but um, it's you know, good, good, good for the folks for speaking up and saying we didn't get counted. And now we can at least um, take that into consideration. So we appreciate you bringing it up today, in particular. Okay. So let's see. What else, let's see if there's any other little last-minute things. Can we? Thanks for finding that, by the way, guys. I mean, that was. So that's how powerful it was. So we were able to prove that yes, that was absolutely the case. So good. All right. So a couple little last-minute things. So we want to give you the option now to do a couple of things. One is um, maybe some of you have sat here, played redistricting the home game. And uh, you've um, come up with a, a proposal. And what we simply mean by a redistricting proposal is where you've looked at it and you've laid out what you think the population boundaries, the new population boundaries, and the new population totals uh, ought to be uh, countywide. And you figured those out. So we have the opportunity to bring forward a proposal. Um, and one of the reasons why we, I want to be clear about why we ask a proposal to have all five districts represented is because, as you just saw, the population numbers change dramatically. So it wouldn't be just enough to say, I want to do, draw the boundaries for District 1 because it really has then that ripple effect throughout the rest of the district. So that's why we're looking for proposals that take into account all five district boundaries and population shifts that you would, might suggest. Um, the other option you have tonight is to make a suggestion. 
And here it might be the suggestion of saying, make sure that this population gets, you know, um, put into one district. Or it might be, you know, don't do this. Um, I always like the do statements rather than the don't statements because the do statements are a lot clearer and a lot easier for us to follow. Um, don'ts mean you could do all kinds of other things too. So um, as we're going to go through public comment period, we you know, invite you to think about what is it proactively or, or, or prospectively you'd like us to do and would like the supervisors to take into considerations. So tonight, um, starting here in about two minutes, you're going to have the chance to, uh, to either make a proposal or make a suggestion to us. Uh, and we'd like to give everybody, each person uh, up to three minutes. You don't have to take your whole three minutes if you don't want to utilize your three minutes. But we'll start with three minutes uh, for your proposal. And uh, you, can, you can get on the public record and, and do that. When you come forward, all I ask is that you just give us uh, your name and the city you live in. And uh, then you're free. Uh, we'll start the time on your, on your three minutes uh, to make your suggestion. And we're going to use the podium right there. Anybody? Suggestions for now, and then we can go back and do questions. Go ahead. one district to another because um, supervisors in particular are elected in alternating some three, three supervisors are re-elected in one year in a two-year cycle and then the next cycle two others are with five supervisors in all um, someone who was planning on voting for supervisor in two years if they get moved to another district they essentially are disenfranchised that is to say they have to wait four years rather than two. Similarly, there are people who just voted and were planning on voting four years, and they get moved into another district, and they can vote earlier. Uh, I'm not as concerned about people who get to vote earlier, but if uh, I don't see it as a criteria, and I'm not even saying it's a legal one, but from the standpoint of moving people, um, I'm not going to make this a don't one. I'll say, let's move as few as possible. And I'd also say that a lot of people, the other reason for this is a lot of people are confused as to who their supervisor is. And it's hard enough when there's continuity, but suddenly someone says, well, I, my supervisor's in the second district, for example, and uh, they find out that's not so anymore, but they may find out later. Uh, and I'd say the same is true for supervisors who want to know who their people are and, and the expense of notifying people and all of that. So, so. I leave it to counsel to de describe whether this is a legal criteria or not. I doubt it is, but from a practical standpoint, um, I think there is value to that being considered. That is to move as few people as, as necessary. I'll say differently, let's not move more than we have to. Others who'd like to make public comment, I appreciate that. Thank you. While she's coming up, we do have, sorry, while she's coming up, we do have the option if you want to do just written comments, you're free to just do written comments as well. And these slips are on the back table back there and you can leave those with me and we can do it that way. So go ahead. My name is Mickey Flax and I live in the first district. Um, I just wanted, I don't know if this is a do or a don't, it's a caveat. Um, and, and for the audience as well as you guys, um, this is a very political, capital P, process. Uh, it's not as simple as computer programs and uh, lines on a map. Who is in which district will often determine how that district votes, which political party, which people are likely to be elected or reelected. I think we know that, um, but we should be aware of it. And um, it goes together with move as few people as possible. 
because uh, we don't want in this technical process to change necessarily uh, political realities. So we should be aware that this is not simply a numbers game. Thank you. Other public comments? Okay. Going once, going twice, <laughs> three times. Okay. So um, feel free if you'd like to submit written comments. We're absolutely um, wanting to take those. This is part of the public record. Actually, the recording of the session is a part of the public record. So I uh, wanted to keep that in mind. So adding your written comments is um, also quite, um, quite possible. Yes, sir. Is it worth it to bring up uh, what uh, Dick Weinberg brought up before? About the uh, missing, uh, yes, yes, it's worth it to bring it up now. Yeah, you know, if, if somebody here, if you'd like to, it could go on the public on the recording. If you'd like to bring up the undercount in that one area, um, it is part of the public record. I mean, we've been making the comments kind of all the way through the discussion and the demonstration. So, um, but if somebody else from if from the public would like to do that rather than just have it be from me, that's fine too. So, oh, good, thank you, sir. That'd be great. What's the name of the Sandpiper, yeah. Sandpiper. Uh, Miguel Checa, 1085 Kramer Road, Carpinteria. Um, I would like to uh, insist that the undercounting that we have discovered for Carpinteria be adequately researched and corrected because it has significant impact on the allocation of resources for our city. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that being on the record with that. Okay. Other public comments? Are there questions people are left with wondering as we leave tonight? Any questions? Yes, ma'am. So if we play with it at home with the interactive map, um, but it doesn't, we can't end up with something visually then, is that correct? Because yeah. Yeah, you, yeah. so the question was if you, yeah, the question is if you play with the home tool on the website, can you print it out and, and do, and get something visual that you could walk in with? And the, the short answer to that is no, you can't um, get a, a printout. Um, what it would do is it'd give you the ability to um, at least, um, because part of the labeling, if I remember this right, is the, it's got the census blocks and track ID numbers um, also available on the viewer. So you could, um, you could make a list of those you'd want to move from census, what census blocks you'd move from one district to another. And then that list could really help move that process of rebuilding the map forward pretty quickly. And once yes. we do that, does that, we can say, okay, like, you know, forward that then to the Board of Supervisors? Yes. Or how does that yes. So, great question. So, thank you very much for asking. So, then the next step, if you were to go in and you create a map, um, you don't get it all um, real big like that, but you can get a PDF of this in, in 11 by 17 and all the data reports, all the demographic reports. Um, you take those two pieces. Um, along with the files that they will have saved on their computers. There's a sub very simple uh, a submittal form that you just kind of have contact information on, um, and you attach those pieces together, and you submit them by June 17th, close of business on June 17th, and that will be taken into consideration by the Board of Supervisors at the July 12th meeting. Okay? So thank you very much for asking. That. June 17th would be the deadline for submittal of the pr of a proposal. Good. Good. Any other questions? There was another question floating around. No? Well, with that, I, I really do, I want to thank all of you for coming and participating at the very first one. We appreciate all of your, um, your thought and your concern and your um, desire to be a part of the process. And we look forward to seeing you at one of the GIS sessions. 
uh, or at one of the upcoming board meetings as well on the topic of the county redistricting plan. So thank you very, very much for being here. Thank you. I may make a play for the K